Let's go. Hello everybody, it's Carrie Benedict and Celia Swales and we are your hosts today for a conversation that is gripping the world. It's a conversation around global leaders thriving and what we need to look at around our thriving for the companies, for the leadership, for the businesses, for the families that we all lead and what is it that we really need for the future of leadership. So our special uh, guest today in the conversation, in the hub, in the house, whatever it is, Karen Jensen, you are so welcome. So how are you today? <laughs> I am great and thank you so much. I'm so excited to be in this conversation with you ladies. It's going to be so much fun. Well, the, the reason we're together is we have to leave what lead what matters and the human connection we have found, particularly during the, the COVID uh, pandemic, has really come to the fore. Connections are now quicker and probably just as difficult as before. We instantly don't need a passport or any visas to cross countries, to cross continents, to cross divides of ocean, magnificent oceans. We are able to connect really quickly. Now, today, of course, we're coming to you from not only Sydney, but Melbourne and Brisbane. So we're doing the Eastern Seaboard here in, in Australia. And it is our absolute pleasure to have you as part of the conversation. So let's talk about what this human connection is all about. Now, we can't start a conversation, Celia, without us telling everybody a little bit about ourselves, perhaps what's unique about us, and what's different about us? So I'm going to put you right on the spot, Celia. Off you go. Yes, um, uh, what is unique? I would say what's unique is I is I like to muck around with clay on weekends. So I like to sculpt. I have a bit of a creative bent. And I really love the outlet of that. I think, you know, it travels back from time of playing as a child playing in mud. Uh, this just looks a bit more, you know, productive maybe. <laughs> And what, what makes me the same as everybody else, one of the things that I've learned the older I've gotten is the things that you think are really unique about you are actually the same as everybody else. And when you actually secretly share them, take up the sort of courage and say, oh, I do this, often you get a, well, of course, in response. And so I like to think there's a hell of a lot about me that is uh, similar to other people. That that is that it's really reflecting on it. What about you, Karen? Now you're up in a higher temperature than we are today. So what is it yes. that you think about you and similar? Um well I think I think uh what is different about me is there's you know, I'm a 50-year-old CEO of a software company. So female mm -hmm. with children. And so you know that um you don't get too many of us. I think there's certainly more out there, but I think, um, you know, I've had a, a desire to to make change in the world for a long time and to be given the opportunity to contribute to that and to start the way so that future generations can continue and expand and evolve on that is pretty exciting. So um, but I've always had that drive. And I think the thing that's similar, and I think it's in a little way a bit to what you were you were talking about, is that, you know, my reason for doing this is because I I saw things happening in business and wondering why and real and thinking it, it doesn't have to be this way. And I think, we, you know, at our heart, leaders, workers everywhere have known this. Mm -hmm. And to me, that's what's similar. Like the conversations I have and the resonance that has with people, and I think particularly now through COVID, and we're starting to see that break open because mm -hmm. people are just no longer willing to accept the status quo as it was. It's time for change. And I think that's the similarity is people, they, you know, workplaces need to be better and we need to be kinder to each other. That's the secret. Mm. And you'll notice, everyone, we're all surrounded by a constellation of twinkles, some shining. So <laughs> it's great to be amongst two shining, shining stars. Um, something about me uh, that's a bit unique. Well, I decided for my 50th birthday uh, a little while ago now to walk Kokoda up in Papua New Guinea. 
it was the first time I'd ever done a walk, the first time I'd ever slept in a tent. <laughs> wow. And the first time probably that I realised that um, it was more about my headspace than my physical um, mm -hmm. ability because mm -hmm. five got airlifted out, two men died on the track at the same time and I came home. Now, wow. So I think that's pretty pretty amazing. Something that's similar about me, oh, well, I'm um, I'm a carry ma, and we have at the current moment we've got seven little Australians, five of which we haven't seen very much of because they're across the border where you are, Karen, and two here in Sydney. And hopefully, I'll put the word out that there's probably got to be a few more. But anyway, <laughs> that's a little bit about me. So family, no, family is important for all of us. Yeah. <laughs> So leading the conversation today, we're, we're really going to look at, you know, this notion of what is it that leaders will need to take us forward to, into the future? People are our constant, aren't they? And as far as I know, we haven't quite destructed the whole human race at, at the moment. We're, 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 we're still a given that we will need a way to connect with each other. We'll need a way to uh, sustain ourselves, whether it's through employment, community, um, what is it? So our people do matter. And so that's what we really want to talk about. And I know, Karen, you've got a background in neuro capability and research, and now you are the CEO of a super interesting company um, that has Re is really focused on engagement and getting the best performance out of the people that are that are working together. So our conversation is going to go around and around like that today. So, <laughs> yeah, look, um, look, absolutely, and I think it's it's so. It, I just hazard hazard to guess that it's so much more than engagement. Um, and, and you know that's certainly where we where we're playing. And I love the, you know, you're talking about this need. Um, to connect and you know we've done all of that work or you know been working or trying to do all of that work in our communities and we we do it in our families we know it's important in our families we need to connect we have a sense we need to do it in our communities the best communities are connected people feel safe um, yet we don't do it in the workplace mm. so this this social connectedness is all around us yet we don't do it in the workplace and in fact we compete it's yes. command and control and it's competition. And I just think there mm. there is room for that, but it, uh, the world and the way that it's changed and the way that we work no longer is working well that way. Mm. And we need organisations need to find a new way of doing this. We've been watching that for, for decades, trying to get right. to the core of that. And we've been looking at engagement. We've been looking at culture. We've been looking at resilience. We're looking at all the things we need to do to our staff to make them better. Yes. But it's not with our staff. It's not there. <laughs> it's, it's the environment that we've created that we actually don't allow them to thrive. So, yeah, that's the, the space that we play in, in how do we just yeah. even help organisations to understand what's happening so that and they I can at first see it so then they have mm -hmm. they want to change it not because they have to they want to and i think you know we were having a little bit of a chat before we started today and that idea of the phrase you often hear in businesses is it's not personal <laughs> and, and yet it is incredibly personal and i think over in past times mm. leaders have used that disconnect of it's not personal in order to be able to take up that leadership space so is there is is from your experience what sort of capabilities do people leaders need to start developing now so that they can manage the messy of the connectedness yeah the messy mm. the messy well i think it's basically that's that connectedness like having a sense and understanding of what it even means to connect and a desire mm. to do so um it's also it's always been you know it's a hr issue it's hr issues to fix the people piece and you know so we can get our job done but the whole role of a leader it is a gift to be asked to be a leader. It's not, it's not a right. It's not something you take for granted. When if you are, if you're invited to become a leader, you have a responsibility to care for those people around you and to nurture them. And 
in order to do that, we actually have to understand them. And, but we also have to understand ourselves. So, you know, if we're, leaders don't have that skill. That's the one thing they're not taught. So they can't influence the people around them because they don't even know what the people around them need or are looking for because we actually don't even take the time to ask. COVID has, again, just opened that up and made everybody realise how important it is, but it's always been there. Yeah. Um, the other part of it is that we weren't ever able to see it either. So engagement doesn't help you to see it. Culture doesn't help you to see it. We can see the impact. We can see the after effects, but when we don't see what's causing it. And when you can now see that, well, now you have something very tangible to start to action. And so leaders can learn that in real time, experiment that. But we also need to make leaders psychologically safe as well. <laughs> so that they're vulnerable enough. Uh, they're, they're allowed to be vulnerable enough to go, oh, I don't know how to do that. But, you know, it's not massive amounts of training. Let's, let's just show you what you need to do more of. Mm -hmm. It's going to help you embrace the people in your care and for them to feel that. That safety net is just so important for all of us and we know that any human being we think about it uh any new situation you go into any new group any new class as a child any meeting you know the the energy changes depending on the leadership in that room and how they approach and embrace the people around them we all know it we've all experienced it it's um you said something just just before uh around fixing the people and i think that's been a mindset that we've uh, we've all thought that leaders that was what leaders did was fix their people, um, and it, it sort of we can flip that and say well it's actually getting to know our people and getting to know ourselves first as the leader. Um, yes. So there's there's so much around that self awareness and you know if we could expedite that if there was a magic pill for that I think we'd all be up for shares in it. Um, <laughs> Well, it is really simple. I think that's, you know, we've made it too complex. We've made it too complex with um, and in and in that mentality of having to fix the people. We don't need to fix the people. We need to understand them. Yeah. And, and that's really simple. That's that's a, such a simple process. And um, then we just need to support the leaders in helping them to understand what they need to do more often. And that's really simple. These are really foundational skills. And um you know, leaders, leaders are stuck between a rock and a hard place. You know, they know they need to get the business to perform because without that business performing, we're not going to have people to employ. We can't mm. offer them employment. So these mm. things are, are hand in glove. They sit together. So if you can support your people to, to and influence them and give them the experience that wants them to be in the workplace with you, and commit mm. to you and believe in you as a leader. They trust you. Uh, your actions replicate your words all the time. You can be trusted. People will have your back, and that actually makes your role as a leader so much easier. You don't then have to fix so many things yeah. because your people take responsibility. So we actually need to build leadership throughout organisations, not just at the top level. Help everyone to yeah. become leaders of their own uh, destiny, really. Yeah, so it's a real um, mindset position um, that that you're suggesting being adopted by everyone, as opposed to a position that you get gifted in in, in that sense as well. There's there's the opportunity for you to say, well, this is I'm in this business, and this is my leadership that I offer into the business as well. Yeah, well, yeah, absolutely. I think it makes your role easier if you know the people who work with us in an organisation, they're not children. We're not in a preschool. We don't need to baby them. They're adults. And we need to co-opt them in and include them in what we're doing. And when they're doing that, they take responsibility. They want to take responsibility for what they want to do. I think, you know, one of those things that is similar about all of us is we have a purpose. We know inside of us we have a purpose or we want to know we have a purpose or we want to know that we matter or that yeah. what we do matters when we go to work. There is no worse feeling than going to work and feeling blur, like this is for nothing and nobody cares and I don't care. Like there is no worse feeling than that. Yes. Um, and so I think that's yeah. what we've got to remove. Once you start to remove that, um, you remove a lot of the issues that are at play. Um, and with leaders, you know, there's, there's just a lack of clarity and communication around these things. So that creates 
you know, conflicting messages and assumptions and biases and perspectives. And we can clean all of that up very quickly by simply focusing on all of the very foundational things. And, but you need to measure that. You need to be able to understand that. And, you know, so that's why we're measuring psychological safety and that's mm. where we start. And we're measuring those threat and reward uh, triggers that happen internally in the workplace um, mm. that lead to the behaviour. The behaviour is the outcome when you're, you've been triggered. And that might be that I don't feel included. When you are not included in the decision, when you are not included uh, or when you feel like you're constantly excluded from opportunities within your organisation, that's what creates the problematic behaviour. Mm -hmm. you, know, you don't feel like you trust the people around you. You know, that's what leads to the problematic behaviour because you're second guessing, you're creating stories in your head, trying to justify people's actions. But at yeah, the root, you don't trust them. So all of these things are very basic human things that we just haven't got right in the workplace. It'd be great, though, if we could dust everybody, just sprinkle everybody with the leadership secret sauce, you know, that we're, that we're all looking for. You know, it's a bit like our, our constellation, our, our sparkling lights. I mean, every one of us, I believe, um, has potential. And to be able to give people the opportunity to develop their skills, to be able to contribute where they where they feel comfortable and confident, but also be, to be stretched um, a little bit to develop the next set of skills. I mean, isn't that what life's all about? You know, the little Carrie when she was five years old or the little Celia or the little Karen, um, you know, gradually we've had stages of development as, as we've gotten older and, and greyer. Um, uh, but it's, it's like that, isn't it? I think for leaders, uh, there'll be some that do a jump more quickly in, in the post-COVID era um, after the last couple of years. I mean, if we look around the world, Karen, there's there's some some ex exponential change happening. Um, you know, there's huge uh, um, implications for how we're actually even conducting the way we do work and how we invoice for work, uh, let alone, you know. So I'd love to know what some of, some of that le leadership secret source is that we, we could really start to stir the pot with? Um, how could we sprinkle everybody with uh, some Well, some I think you, you you can't, you know, <laughs> it would be nice if we had a secret source <laughs> and knew some of these sparkly things that you have all right around us and we could just drop that across everybody. But, you, you know, it's it, it's where I started from. You, you have to see it first. You have to be able to measure it. You have to be able to show people what are the gaps that they've got? Let's not assume what the gaps are. And I think that's a lot of the mistakes that we've been making is we identify a, a gap in an organisation with regards to something and we go, okay, well, great, we need to get our leaders into training. So off we go and they're all going to training, assuming yeah. that every single leader has that same issue. And that's not true. Oh. Every single leader, every single team, every single organisation has yeah. its own thumbprint for one of a better word they're all very different and yeah. it's not a matter of what they do good or what they do bad it's what they don't do enough of so most yeah. of the time people are doing this stuff but they're not doing it all the time and simple things as um you know helping uh listening to the opinions of your your team members and your colleagues allowing space to listen and validate those opinions and talk about them respectfully so if that doesn't happen all the time, this is what starts to just build the discontent. So we first need to see where that's occurring. Where are these things that are occurring that are, are triggering these non-conscious threat responses because we don't feel valued, we don't feel heard, we don't feel included. Um, and so if we can see that, then it's simply that the leaders themselves can recognise it and, you know, Pretty much every single leader I have worked with so far has has looked at the results and just gone, "That's not what I want." You know, that's not like I, that's not what I was trying to do. I want to be this. Yeah. Yeah. It wasn't that they didn't have the intention. I've, I have actually been really buoyed by seeing that most leaders, I would say, ninety eight percent of leaders, actually have a desire inside to leave a great impact in their team. Yeah. They're so busy doing their job and everything else that they have to do and they have never been taught how to do this or what to look for or how to understand it, yet we're trying to get them to do it all. So we yeah. hire them for a skill and then yeah. we go, oh, yeah, while you're at it, can you do this? 
with yeah. an expectation that they should because you're a leader well you were given that role you should be able to do that but we haven't really given them any training to do that and all of you know there's a whole lot of work around psychological safety and uh, neuroscience of leadership and all of that stuff so really what you know what it's all about is starting to understand bring the science into business and connect both of those so once again stop looking at everything in silo same as what we're trying to do in business let's stop looking at all the departments in silo and let's look at the cause and effect across the whole department of decisions that you make so when you make a decision or when you go through a change process or when you undergo transformation or when you're trying to be a provider an employer of choice what are the things that you're not doing enough of that are making people feel excluded and disconnected from your organization because mm -hmm. if you don't fix that you can't get to any of these other places you there's, have to fix those things first there's a lovely colleague of carrie and ours uh, who talks about in uh unintentional exclusion and intentional mm -hmm. inclusion and i and, and i'm hearing that in what you're talking that 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 we're not actually saying that these leaders are going out there to create disconnects and to create impersonal workplaces and to create a workplace where it's unsafe to go, I disagree. Their, their, their intention is there. It's the, the, um, the, they're not seeing what they need to act on and, and then follow through on um, and, and learning by doing that as well. It seems that that, that, yeah. that piece in order to become unintentionally exclusive to being intentionally inclusive yeah, yeah. if you yeah. want the greatest change in an organization it is that learning as you're going through that's the greatest yeah. teacher that you have time to try it mm. reflect talk about it and go oh did that work did that you know what can we tweak you know as amy Edmondson says becoming a yeah. learning organization yeah. That's what we need to, we need a space for our leaders to do that. Then we need mm -hmm. to train our leaders. Leaders actually need to become coaches. I'm not mm -hmm. saying go off and do a coaching course. Mm -hmm. um, and if you want to, that's great. But leaders don't have coaching skills. They don't have mentoring skills. And that's mm -hmm. what you need to do to be able to support your team to come together in order so that you can hear their ideas. It's in those ideas that the creativity sits and the mm -hmm. innovation that organisations need. And if there is any part of your organization that is remaining silent because it just does not trust that you have its be their, you know, their, those people's best intentions at heart, you're not getting the full benefit of that, of innovative um, ideas. So, you know, that we have to, organizations globally are all looking at how they can be more innovative because they know they need to be. And the, the business world's just changing really rapidly. Yeah. then we need to support leaders now, not send them off to training. We need to support leaders now to understand what is it they need that can support them and guide them through this. Mm -hmm. You know, what communication do they need to focus on? Um, you know, all of those sorts of things. So it's well, uh, it feels like a big job, but it's actually, you know, it's really not. It's um, It gets, you can, as you start to as you start to build the psychological safety in a team, and it's not something you achieve, because we, you know, every organisation, you'll lose a manager, you'll lose team members, new ones will come in. So it's always an ebb and flow, but it's that attention, deliberately paying attention to what's going on in the environment and then being able, being confident and effective in actually addressing it in the moment, not allowing it to fester. That is the key piece that leaders, and I've, I'm really concerned that leaders are struggling to actually do that right now out of fear of dis, you know of causing more harm to people mm -hmm. and so um, they're not addressing these things well I, I, on the tip of my tongue has been this is about individual fear mm -hmm. as well as cultural mm -hmm. fear and as organizational fear i think as well and yeah that's uh that's a, a big incentive or a big blocker mm -hmm. either one or the other you well it can be a big block. you know you know the data comes through and we see it so many times in organizations the majority of their teams will be in the sector where they have you know really good levels of psychological safety but they yeah. aren't performing you know, they're not performing to the performance of the company. They're underperforming. And every single time it's because leaders are trying so hard to protect the well-being, the mental health yes. of their people, they yeah. no longer feel confident being able to actually help them to be accountable 
and to yeah. reach the goals that they set. Yeah. So we still have this, it's a zero sum game. You know, we, it used to be, well, the business has to perform and we'll just get rid of people if we don't need them. We can't, yeah. we can't look after both. It's either or. And now we're seeing it at team levels and leadership levels. Well, I have to look after the mental health and well-being of my people, mm -hmm. um, which means I can't make them perform. But if you do that, not only are you losing huge amounts of revenue, um, but your people get bored. You, you, you are giving them permission to feel psychologically mm -hmm. safe not to perform. And yes. it might feel good in the moment, but it'll actually lead to boredom and you'll lose your best your best staff because yeah. they yeah. want challenges we want purpose we want a challenge we want to know that we're actually growing we want to know we're getting training and support and we're becoming better than and we have visions of who we want to be so in the long run it does it's of no benefit to the company anyway well there's nothing like the impetus of a win is there if you know yeah. or, or yeah. something that's um uh you know is a boost the way i look at it i mean yeah. whether you're part of you know the NRL team that just won the grand final <laughs> after how many years in the in the wilderness? You know, um, or you when, <laughs> <laughs> we'll use a colloquial example. Um, but it, it, there's nothing like uh, that boost that you get, yeah. even if mm. it just puts a little smile on your face or in your heart, yeah. when someone um, or the result is. Uh, what you've been aiming for all the time. So you can see how that is amplified across a, 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 across a business or an organisation, but even in your family, you know, uh, it, it has huge impact. So, you know, away with fear, away with fear, and let's bring on... Well, what I think we fear is good in small doses. It keeps yeah. us focused. It keeps us, um, you know, so we don't go off and make really stupid mistakes. <laughs> But, you know, I think the key to leadership is to notice where that fear is in your people and to yeah. be able, you know, once they're being back to coaching and mentoring, mm -hmm. how do we speak with people in a trusting, safe environment to go, what's happening there? You mm -hmm. feel, you know, you seem stuck. What's going on? What's that triggering for you? And for the, yeah, by the same token, leaders having access to somebody to do that for them because as humans we all get fearful and yeah. we need to talk those things through to push yeah. us, you know, just to push us through. Um, to the next place. Um, and we're not, all, of, all of us are advocates for, for having a coach or a mentor or both or many or some uh, for different purposes. Otherwise, we wouldn't feel that we had any credibility. Um, you know, yeah. so, you know, I, I think um, there's some there's some interesting examples around the globe, aren't there, around what how people um, or how, how things have changed because of the circumstances. Um, and Karen, with your work, you'd find plenty of organisations looking at finding what's missing so they can put the magic ingredients together to get the best recipe. I like to think that, um, you know, leaders will be chefs, chefs <laughs> of culture. <laughs> I'm <laughs> by trade, so I'm going to go back to the kitchen. Um, <laughs> There's a recipe. Every one of us is a leader within our own right, and our listeners will be as well. And it's what we do with that recipe. It's how we've learnt it, how we've yeah. trialled and errored it, how we've found out, you know, what what little percentages we have to jig. Um, but we get the evidence because we get a product. There's a product there that says this is a bomb carry or this is absolutely beyond imagination and it's beautiful. Yeah. So... I, I think, I'm, you know, in what I see is that I think organisations have been, are satisfied with being meh. Yeah. Meh is okay. Yes. You haven't gone under. Meh is okay. We're getting through. Yeah. I don't think, I think it's really sad that organisations have no insight into how brilliant they could really be. And they they often believe it's for the chosen few, like there's a few rock star leaders or organisations or, you know, you, and we look at Google and Facebook and all that sort of stuff to go, well, they're just exceptional and, you know, they don't have our constraints in our markets and all that sort of stuff. And um, I just don't believe it's true. I just think every leader, every, every person can be a high performance leader. But it, you simply, they simply need to know what they have to focus on. And we often focus on 
a whole range of technical skills or theories that we've learned and then we're trying to take back into the workplace, but we're taking them back on our own. Nobody's working cohesively. There's no cohesive, cohesive commitment through the company on what you want to achieve. Mm -hmm. um, and so you can't achieve those changes or you won't sustain those changes because we know habits take a long time to develop. So, you know, we're, we're investing huge amounts of money trying, trying to unlock the secret, and to me, the key's just hanging above the lock and we just need to take it and put it in and undo it. Um, sometimes that's about as easy as it feels. It's like it's, um, you know, there's a, it's, we need to get back to the fundamental basic stuff of just connecting and how to connect as human beings, stop judging each other, be more curious with our questions, ask so we can guide them and help them to become the best versions of themselves. Those who don't enjoy that, they won't stay around. You won't have them in your team. Those that do, they'll thrive and then your organisation thrives. And, you know, the biggest, you're asking, you know, what we're seeing around the world, you know, the biggest inquiry we have and the, the companies we're working with are the ones that have recognised they have to become innovative. They can no longer do what they used to do. They need their people to become innovative. And they're reaching out going, we actually don't know how to do that. We don't have a culture that supports being innovative because our people don't want to speak up. Our people are too scared to speak up. They're too scared to make a mistake. They're too scared. They don't feel like they're included in decision making. All of these things will I will not allow these organisations to reinvent themselves post-COVID into this and it is going to change. So those those leaders, at, you know, those CEOs and boards that recognise that and are now mm -hmm. taking a proactive step to address that and support the leaders all the way through the organisation and the managers and the supervisors and the team leaders, they've all got to be travelling in the same direction to achieve what they need in the organisation to become who they need yeah. to be. They've got and to get in got to get into that mix master all together. <laughs> <laughs> I th and I think also yeah. one better one than of, the blender. Yes, <laughs> better than the blender. <laughs> or, a, or a walk. <laughs> well, we're talking disruption, aren't we? This is what we're doing. So, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a good analogy yeah. for disruption. You know, it's, it's how, yeah. do we, how do we actually take the disruption and go let's let's use it as the time to do the thinking do something different uh but keep keep focused on what we want as the end result and find out where the um where the energy is because I, I look at disruption as as energetic as well it's not just disruption just for dormancy it's actually for to energize something new and you know that you know you talked about the, the the fast pace of innovation at the moment and creating this. I mean, we have seen some amazing things happen. Um, so, our, our, you know, and the human element of this is so important. And even those who um, don't really want to be part of anything new, be happy with the status quo, you know, um, they, once they feel valued for their contribution, I'm sure they, it, it's, it's sort of a... Yeah. A ripple effect um, that we're talking about now. Well, I think we have to um, acknowledge you know, that that's the first step. Number one, we have to acknowledge people don't like to change. So organisations are throwing transformation and change projects projects out on mass. Like, oh, we're going to do this, and hey, everyone will be excited. Human, the human, the human yeah. being most of the time hates change, and we have different. <laughs> yeah, like we have different levels of acceptance for that, every single person. Yeah. So if we don't even consider that so, that for some people that will actually trigger mm. a threat response, mm. um, you know, will I have a job? What will my role be? What yep. are we going to do? How can I cope? Can I learn more software? Like I'm feeling exhausted. I've got so many programs I have to learn. And we don't give people space and support in order to take time to catch up to that or we don't communicate with clarity what that change project will mean and if it's, you know, just once again being done to them with the expectation, oh, just join in and you will, people don't. So they'll push back and, um, you know, a, a colleague I have calls it the possums in the roof, you know, they become the possums, the destructors in the roof. Um, it's that silent stuff that is all the, uh, that's where all the opportunity and potential lies 
or the risk in your organization because it takes you longer to get up to speed and get products to market or to, that service to market or whatever the change is. Um, so I think we have to a take time to just recognize and accept how that plays out and the effects that has and have those conversations with your team. What does that mean? Yeah. And take time to answer the question. But I also think we have to take time to recognize, I know people globally are exhausted. They're yeah. going into burnout and that burnout's not, yes, because they're working more hours because we're at home. We, we, we know that's in the research, but we've all been living with cortisol for the last two years and this not knowing what is going to happen in the world. That yeah. cortisol has an impact on your body and that's still going to be playing out for quite a while. So I think, you know, let's acknowledge that leaders themselves are exhausted. So we don't want to be piling even more responsibility on top of them. We actually need to support them proactively and with actions that they can do and implement every single day very easily, like nothing new. You know, just mm -hmm. sit down and have a conversation with your colleague. Ask them some questions. Yeah. Mm. The, um, I think you, you, you've hit on that communication, those skills of how to communicate um, are, are not easy depending on your perception of how you see those that you work with. And I think <laughs> there's, a, there's, a, there's a link there as well. And if we were mm. able to communicate more clearly, and I know there are some days where I do a great job on communicating, and other, day, other days I think, well, everybody should know what I'm on about. Why, why can't I just get the quick answer, right? You know, I'm talking family here. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but, but, you know, you know it's, it's real. And I think the human connection here with what we're talking about is, is the critical issue. We, yeah. you know, we're all somebody's beautiful baby. Yeah. Uh, we were created in a magnificent um, and unique way, all of us, and... Being able to treat each other with dignity and respect is is something that we we I think the world is actually calling for. I, I may sound like I'm very Pollyannery, but I do believe there is so much intent for kindness and for partnerships and sharing um, what you have because lots of economic circumstances have have altered as well, um, and our large companies, our large organisations. Um, for them to have an effect in a marketplace that relies on sales of whatever it is that they are offering means that people actually have to know and like them and trust them. Mm -hmm. So we, we, could, we could actually just turn it around. It's just a bit like an orb spinning around going, you know, these are the skills we need, these are the mindsets and these are the capabilities that we need to develop for success, for humanity. And, what yeah. we do. and one, of the, um, one of the things that you mentioned there is kindness. I was reading something the other day that said, you know, what the world needs now is just more kindness. But rather than just saying that, the, the the author was sort of saying what we the one thing that we need to do is actually extend the benefit of the doubt that we give our close friends and family like oh they're late well they'll be late because something important held them up we need to extend that broader mm -hmm. and that what kindness looks like uh in the workplace is actually giving someone the benefit of the doubt and having like a positive attribution around what it is that they that might have made that happen, that circumstance happen, and mm -hmm. and I thought that was a really lovely, like you say, Karen, something very simple. It's mm. not some highfalutin theory that needs to be kind of three D modelled. It's just yeah. oh, well, you're late. Well, there must have been a reason for it. Well, I think it's yeah. Is everything okay? Mm. Is everything okay at home? Yep. Like yep. yeah, I, I think allowing time, um, but. You know, I think the, the one issue or the one complexity I think people get confused with with kindness is the the fear to hold people to account. Yep. So as we, like it, it's yeah. it's perceived that kindness you can't challenge people on their yep. behaviours, yep. and of course leaders need to be able to do that. They need to make a call, but. You know, the, I think there is a way to come at that that involves kindness, involves less judgment, as I said, more curiosity, what's going on, what's happened for you, 
um, and getting to that. And then, of course, you know, if they're late for two yeah. weeks in a row or, you know, missing yeah. crucial, then you've got a whole different story. Yeah. Um, but um, but it's, you know, it's, you know, we have to communicate from the get-go um, with yeah. clarity. We have to not allow things, you know, this holding people accountable even fairly, like everybody having the same accountability. So, yeah. you know, not, not having members of your team who get away with coming late and members who, who aren't allowed to come in late. And if that is the case, you know, making that very clear in the team why that might be the case. So some transparency. Um, I know we have privacy issues in there, but these things have to be dealt with so people aren't mm. creating these abstract stories in their head that are based on their own previous experiences so they're misinterpreting what's happening. It's this misinterpretation of things. That's why communication is so important. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, and you know, I think that's you know, to me, the the value of having coaches mm -hmm. for leaders. Yeah. So they can unpack that thinking, mm -hmm. um, and then you know that helps to teach them to help their staff to unpack their thinking because at the end of the day, they do have to make decisions. They do have to have the final say. But it's in how you get to that point that makes all the difference. Um, so mm. you just made me uh, think about being part of a staff where you knew that on a Monday you couldn't talk to somebody on staff till about one o'clock in the afternoon because they hadn't thought out from, you know, get, having to come to work on Monday or wow. those or those <laughs> you awesome. would go missing at three o'clock or earlier on a Friday. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> or, so behaviours, and so what I'm alluding to are the behaviours that we all know about each other yeah. Um, yeah. that perhaps we don't know about ourselves or yeah. we we know but we're not quite truthful in owning yeah. up as to the reasons. Um, and that's the role of the leader is to hold yeah. those, you know, to hold those things to account because they're the non-conscious things that fester. You know, the moment that's happening in your team, yeah. And if it's not happening for you or you see it happen to, you know, you can actually feel this on behalf of somebody else. So, um, you know, you might be feeling it on behalf of your colleagues if, you know, yeah, you do have a couple of those colleagues that, you know, leave consistently at three o'clock on a Friday and shirk their responsibility and everybody's there. And, you know, it doesn't get addressed. It doesn't get communicated. It doesn't get dealt with. So it festers and then it starts to play out in little different ways. And that's where we get disengaged. That's where our behaviours start to play out. That's where we get narky with each other. That's where we don't go out of our way to help those people who might be going. You know, all of these things start to create that toxic culture. And yes. it's simply because the behaviour was allowed to fester in the, in the first place. You know, and you know that as a parent, you've got to get onto it straight away. Mm. So. Yes. And if you don't, it goes on for generations. Yeah. So <laughs> uh, it, it, it really is about... In this is, you know, what we do is really arming leaders uh, with confidence and support, A, just to the data to see what they need to do. And then when they know what they're dealing with, it's a lot easier than just to hold people to account and, and achieve the results that they want to achieve um, because you're, you're building all of that trust. So that's, it's, that's a beautiful way to really close off our conversation today because, um, you know, being having... I'm going to use the word arsenal, which is going to probably trigger something. <laughs> yes. have an armory, maybe it's an armory, maybe to have all those, you know, those skills and up our back. that leaders need for, you know, for the future. Um, that's too important to miss out on finding out because in engaging and finding out where the holes are in, in our organisational culture, um, we can often see that there is room for potential to grow um, and opportunity to, to go. And we will unfathom people we never expected or skill sets that we never knew about. Um, and so, you know, for leaders for the future, you know, how to lead what matters, how do we lead our people? Well, we really need to have... I think a new skill set. Um, not not throwing everything away that we have, but this notion of being human, relational, and empathetic, and being able to respect others, and not having a hierarchy of power that over over overrides all of that, um, is now what the world is looking for. Would I be off task? Would I be off off that? <laughs> 
just in the word arsenal. Um, <laughs> but um, no, leaders are looking for it. And, um, you know, I think that's um, that they do need a way forward. They do need to understand how to how to influ better influence their people whilst to perform, mm. but also how to do that in a, but in a psychologically safe way. So then that we're not impacting their well-being and their mental health because it is our responsibility to do no more harm. Don't do any more harm to your people. Like, yeah. um, And it's your environment that impacts that. So that is the one thing leaders have control over is that environment. How does that operate? How how how, I would, how hygienic is that? Mm. Is that environment? Leaders can influence that. Um, and when they do, when you clean up that environment and you make it caring, you make it inclusive, you make it fair, um, you significantly increase your bottom line performance as a result of that because your people come better prepared and more willing to contribute and it, and it happens every single time. So it's a win-win. Um, but leaders just need to know that it's out there. You can do this. It, there is an easy way to achieve it. Mm. And I'd say that's when we get the constellation of twinkles starting. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> A twinkle. Oh, I've had a, I've had a lovely lunchtime chat with you today, Karen and Celia. Um, anything? Is there anything we haven't said that should be said before we sign off and say to people, "Don't forget us next week as well." But we'll do that in a minute. Mm. Something we should have said. You think that needs still to be said? Ah, uh, look, I I dream of the day that all organisations can have warm every team and every organization have warm embracing conversations like this like we can really get down and discuss the the key issues and find ways to resolve them so um yeah i i, I think it's absolutely possible um most of the time and we as a human race will also benefit from that yes. i believe and um the time has come it's been a long time coming and i'm really excited to be able to contribute to moving that forward I tell you well the time has come hasn't it yeah. so it um mm. it's, been, it's been a great conversation see ya yes I think th and I think one of the things that sits with me is that tired leaders can be energized by something inspiring and oh, I think yeah. I think thinking about what's next could be so much uh, more, um, I guess, human. Um, and it might be messy, but it'll have our conversations and we'll see each other and we'll be able to um, to act in the moment and do things like that. I think that can be quite inspiring that there's, a, there's an easy path forward for people. And that then might be a bit of an antidote to the tiredness and weight of what the last couple of years has brought for people hmm. we just mm. shed a little bit of the old armor for the new armor yeah. for the new constellation yeah. <laughs> i like to be a bit provocative have you, you, know, you warm you and your woman <laughs> <laughs> listeners it's been fantastic having you with us today uh we have now started uh lead what matters the human connection a set of uh weekly podcasts you're going to find us on global leaders thrive facebook page every tuesday there will be a recording that you can you you will notice um, we've streamed out uh, through twitter as well today um, it has been a great conversation karen i'm so pleased that you you popped in to be one of the stars in the constellation this afternoon <laughs> and um look forward to further um, conversations. Now, if you would like to know more about what Karen does, um, your best contact, Karen, would be? Oh, absolutely. You can reach out to me at Karen with a double R um, at conductorsoftware.com, uh, www.conductorsoftware.com if you want to check out our website. And, um, yeah, happy to have a chat, happy to help you understand how you can uh, assess the psychological safety of your leaders and your teams and what you can do to actually support them to become high performance leaders and, and to achieve the impact they're looking to achieve. I think we have to give leaders the support to do that. I believe they want to. Absolutely. And Celia, um, 
all of us you will find on LinkedIn as well as many of the socials. But Celia, email address for you, website, what would you like to share? Uh, email probably really easy to remember, Celia at celiaswales.com. <laughs> S-W-A-L-E-S. Um, yes, she's she's a great gal. If you'd like to know more about what I do, that's easy. Carrie Benedet, B E N E D T dot com. And uh, that's us for this week. So, girls, thank you so much for being in the house, thank being you, in the hub, being in the conversation mm -hmm. today. And uh, lead what matters, the human connection is right for now and it's right for the future. So, let's develop those global leaders that we all need. Thanks, Karen. Thanks, Celia. My pleasure. Thanks, Thank you, Karen. ladies. See you again. <laughs> See you, Karen.